My thought was, I'm just going to like run through stuff. It's recorded. You can go back and look at it. Um, it's Friday. You know, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I'll show you what um, the assignment uh, is that we can work on in class a little bit. And then also um, it's not due till Monday because you have me again on Monday. And so if there's questions or something, you can ask that. It'll be due um, midnight on Monday. Is there any, is there anything, is anybody like, oh no, talk to us forever, Mrs. Sollinger, or everybody's like, no, it's Friday. <laughs> it's been a long week. Get us out of here. I have a totally random question. Yes, ma'am. Is, is there a way while you're recording to see how long you oh, have Kelly. been recording? Um, I don't know. Just so I can send out to anybody who's here who like doesn't want to hear us talking about the all the stuff we just talked about and wants to just get to the lecture content or whatever. What I can, yes, what I can do, um, cause I'm gonna put it on you, you know, I go and YouTube it and do all that and I can okay. find the spot at which that starts and put it in the notes or put it for someplace when yeah. I post it to the to the page. Yeah, or for us that just wanna go back to it. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah timestamps, okay. yeah. Great, perfect. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, actually I can probably, oh. well, hello. Uh, let me pause for a moment here. Zoom. Alrighty, so we're looking at uh, this. Should be the homepage, right? You gotta For, share again. It, 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 I'm not. I have to share again. See, this is why I need you guys. My like, guy. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yay. There we go. How's that? Now the homepage is there. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So we're talking um, about in terms of mobility, sensory perception, um, and a little bit about functional ability. Um, these are concepts that we talked about in first semester and, and hopefully have been talking about uh, throughout. We're gonna look at specific examples, um, our exemplars of spinal cord injury and neuro, neural tube defects, uh, specifically spina bifida, which is myelomeningocele, which I believe you guys had a question on, on the um, proctored assessment. So my thought is to, you have your learning outcomes and that's what I would like to do is just kind of go down the learning outcomes um, and show you where the resources are, answer any questions, try and hit some really specific points. Um, you have the quiz that opens today at five um, and then the uh, work to complete by Monday at midnight. And we will talk about, um, about part, some of this during the SCI portion of, the, of today. Um, is the SCI case study, spinal cord injury case study. And basically it gives you a, a scenario and we're gonna go through some priority interventions. My hope is that you can get through, I actually put the dermatome chart there so you have it for reference. Um, we're gonna talk about halo traction and pin care and then um, kind of go into fluid and electrolyte, but there's a, I have a lot of information on bowel and bladder training on the page. And as long as you guys can get through for the homework, um, question nine, like I really want it, I really for the homework would like you to do 10, 11, 12, and 13, but the, for me, your priorities are going to be met for, um, for the quiz and for what you really need to know going through question nine. Okay, and I'll, um, hopefully we can get through most of, through question nine in lecture uh, today. Close that and go back one. Has anybody, let's do, has anybody had any experience? I know some people have had experience with spinal cord injuries. Has anybody had experience or seen um, a baby with a um, neural tube defect, spina bifida? Not necessarily a baby, it could be a, a child or teenager. Um, oops, let me open my chat. I think I need three screens or four screens. There we go. Oh, on Grey's Anatomy, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know. How was it portrayed on Grey's Anatomy? I want to hear if it was if it was realistic or not. Um, they had to do multiple surgeries and insert shunts to be able to shunt the fluid, I think, into her stomach. But then after like a few of those surgeries, she was like able to be fine and not have to have subsequent surgeries. Oh, good. Okay. That makes sense. Cause a lot of times with neural tube defects, we're going to start with neural tube defects. A lot of times you get hydrocephalus, which is fluid uh, on the brain. And so they'll do what it's called a shunt to shunt the fluid. Um, it's a um, atrial ventricular shunt, AV shunt 
from the um, from uh, the brain and it kind of deposits itself in the in the gut to get rid of the, the fluid. So you have um, available to you, there is a spinal cord injury PowerPoint and a neural tube defects PowerPoint that have, um, I think they're about 30 to 40 slides each. Um, and what I would like to do is focus on the objectives and the information that I have in the lesson. Um, but if you have any questions about the PowerPoints over the weekend or on Monday, let me know Monday and we can touch base um, and, and do that. So one of the things that we want to look at, let's go down to, um, actually, I just lied to myself because I don't like the way that's set up. Let's do neural tube real quick. I'm just going to point out a couple slides for you to know. When you think about neural tube defects, um, what motor skills does the person have available? Are we, guys, are we starting from like blank? Nobody really knows anything about neural tube defects. Like I need to start at the beginning because I can do that. That's not a problem. Let's do that. Let me show you pictures. So when you look at the, uh, the spine, right? When you, you have to go back to embryology and how everything gets, gets put together. Everything wraps around the neural tube. So this is, would be the head and this would be the tail. And this is how the, the neural tube is, is coming together. And um, what spina bifida is, is an imperfect closure. It doesn't close all the way. So you end up, see down here, but this is spina bifida, there's this hole. And so what's, what's, what's peeking out of that hole? What is, what's coming out of that hole? Well, it could be different things. One of the key things to remember is that in prevention of neural tube defects, they have found that increasing the folic acid intake um, is what helps to prevent neural tube defects. Once they figured out that that was helping, because I believe what's the um, what's the daily folic acid versus what you take uh, when you're pregnant. Pregnant, and I think is six hundred. Pregnant, pregnant is six hundred. Yes, and uh, normal is uh, non-pregnant would be four hundred. And we see a lot of folic acid in the geriatric population as well. It's a supplement for them as well. Um, and so that's, that's, that's how we get spina bifida. We also have, when we talked a little bit about gastroschisis and umphalocele a couple weeks ago, it's because the front doesn't close all the way around and, and you have things uh, sticking out. So if we look at the types, so these are, the reason it's in blue is because it was like important information to know. Um, so we had, what do we have? We had somebody at SVMH who had, who potentially could have had spina bifida occulta. They went and did an, an ultrasound. So here's where nothing's bulging out, right? And then the one that we see that you could see is meningocele, which that spinal fluid and the meninges, which is the part here, or you can have the myelomeningocele, which is the spinal fluid, the meninges, and then also the nerve roots and parts of the spinal cord. So you guys still with me, right? So this is, this is hidden. You wouldn't necessarily know it's there. There may not even be many deficits. Then you have where it's the fluid and the meninges, and then you have where it's the fluid, the meninges and the nerve roots and spinal cord. Um, and that's where you, you get meningo is membrane and seal is tumor. And so uh, this is just a, a showing you that again, different types of pictures. What you might see with spina bifida occulta is this tuft of hair. I think I have a picture. No, I do, I know I do. Where'd it go? Here it is, spina bifida occulta. So you might have a hairy patch there or what's called a, um, a sacral dimple or pilonidal dimple, right? Cause there's the, the anus and there's this little dimple right there. Um, I don't really, I mean, there's, there's, there's hair there, but it's more of a, a tuft of hair. Um, and so they will do the, um, the different testing. They can do ultrasounds if it's prenatal, um, if they think there's going to be problems at birth, if you see it, then they can do, they can do x-rays, they can do ultrasounds, those types of things. Um, there's also the, um, 
the um, when you do an amniocentesis, remember back to amniocentesis, right, with the um, the diagnostic testing in pregnancy, right? You know, Kelly, I have no idea why hair. I think because of the um, perfusion, the way it gets perfused, perhaps. I, I, I knew somebody was gonna ask that and I've never looked it up. <laughs> um, amniocentesis, yes, thumbs up. People remember amniocentesis. And so what you can do is the maternal alpha feta protein would be increased. Thank you. Uh, and the, um, just the, the, the uh, amniotic fluid um, alpha feta protein, which would be the fetal one, would be increased. So when you see an increase, there's probably some type of um, some type of defect. And so then you ultrasounds and, and looking um, around. Um, usually no treatment. It's often even undetected. Um, the couple times that I've seen it, um, it has been um, they've done the ultrasounds and it's been it's been fine. Okay, we're gonna skip tethered cord because tethered cord is very, it's nice for you to know, but it's, um, it's pretty rare. And it basically just doesn't give you motion because the, um, it's, it's, it's fused, it's not, it's not free. Um, there's a slide on how to, you know, how to know when to, to uh, go further to do more exams, the sacral dimple rule. And then, we move on to meningocele. So everybody good on spina bifida occulta? Sacral dimple, tuft of hair, probably no deficits, do an ultrasound, x-ray something to, to figure it out. Um, portion of membranes uh, with the cerebrospinal fluid uh, that are protruding. Oftentimes there's no symptoms. You don't, um, you don't have the, the bladder problems or the sensation and movement because it's basically just the fluid in a sac. And so you can do surgical closure for cosmetic purposes and to prevent infection. But there's generally not symptoms because there's not the spinal cord and nerve root involvement. However, when you get to the myelomeningocele, it's the cerebrospinal fluid with a part of the spinal cord, the nerves, all that, um, that is protruding out of the spinal column. And if they're, um, you don't have, I mean, Chiari type two malformation, that's in another lecture later on, but can cause hydrocephalus as well. And so it causes a downward compression of the brain into the brain stem, which then pushes the fluid downward as well and pushes the spinal cord. And so it kind of like, if you think of the spinal cord kind of oozing out because the hydrocephalus is kind of pushing it down. And so what happens is hopefully this would have been picked up on ultrasound so that you would know what to expect. There are some um, prenatal surgeries, I guess, that can be done in utero surgeries. That's pretty dangerous, I would think. Um, but we'll get to what to do when the baby's, the baby's born. But that's um, not an actual baby, but a picture of that. So because you have those deficits, because you have that, that lower part of the spinal cord there, what happens is you get, um, can get a, a paralysis and, and decreased sensation in the lower extremities. Uh, you can get uh, hip problems, foot problems, definitely altered urinary, urinary and bowel function. And a lot of time, and most of the time, 80%, there's hydrocephalus. And so what it was Emily, I think, was telling us that um, even on Gray's Anatomy, thank goodness, they were talking about shunting, shunting the fluid um, out of the brain. So you're going to do surgical closure. I wanna say that the question had to do something with, did you cover it or what did you cover cover it with when the baby was, was born? Um, and so you want a sterile, moist, non-adherent dressing. Does that make, does that make sense? Because we have to keep it moist, it's, it's coming from inside. Um, avoid a rectal temp too close. Um, you're going to end up with bladder uh, dysfunctions and then, um, immediate closure. So I think the key points would be the sterile, moist, non-adherent um, dressing. And then, and you're gonna do head circumference as well in case there's hydrocephalus. So here's a picture of after surgery. So before surgery, you're gonna cover it with that moist, sterile, non-adherent dressing. So it wouldn't be like a tegaderm. It'd be literally like sterile gauze. You know, those tubs of sterile gauze and you pour warm, sterile saline, and then you just drop it on there and then put a, a occlusive dressing, um, a, not like tape to it, but like you just wanna make sure it's, it looks like there's several layers or like those ABD pads, 
you know, those long, the longer pads, you can use those as well. And then after surgery, obviously checking temperature, you're gonna check blood work um, and the neurological status. And how would you think you would position the baby? Because we have, this is on their back. So how are you going to position, uh, position the baby? Fine. Prone. Yep, there we go, prone. Couldn't get to my, uh, well, I like to use warm sterile saline because I don't, because it's a baby, right? Thermoregulation is an issue with the baby. I don't want to be pouring, it wouldn't be cold, it'd be room temperature, but oftentimes we can warm it. Um, we actually keep sterile in, I don't know if, I don't know if I've seen it at SVMH, but I know at CHOMP, we actually keep um, bottles, small and large bottles of sterile saline in our warmers, in our blanket warmers. Um, so that we always have some available to keep the thermoregulation. That's a great question. And so we're going to position the baby prone and then turn, you know, turn the head to the side and, and change position that way. We can't really change the position because we have to keep the baby prone. So, but we want to make sure that we're going to be turning the, the head side to side. And then um, skin breakdown. If the if the baby's in that position, you have to watch the, the hips because they're in that one position, um, turn side to side, um, you know, maybe an NG tube to feed, because I really don't want to feed the baby flat <laughs> um, and keep the hips slightly uh, abducted. And then you can do a small roll. If we put, this baby doesn't have a small foot roll, but if you put a little foot roll, it'll help the feet turn um, in a little bit to maintain that position. Oops, go away, there we go. Um, and so oftentimes they'll um, they'll do not right away, but they'll do um, eventually do a suprapubic catheter. So instead of them having to um, cath through the urethra, they'll do a, a suprapubic, which would access through um, like the 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 front, you know, which is kind of cool because then they have better um, they can they have use of arms, so they can reach it better. It's a much easier way and makes makes for independence and self-management of their care. Um, and then ditropan is another medication uh, to help increase the bladder capacity to help, help with that. Um, and then, uh, so see even there, clean technique at home, right? We talked about that in skills yesterday with the trait care, right? So even at home, if you're doing, you're gonna do a straight cath uh, and it's a clean technique. And we're gonna talk about bowel training with um, spinal cord care. So I'm gonna go through and see, I think most of this is spinal cord, spinal cord injury. I'm just looking to see if I have anything for, um, oh yeah, here we go. So this one is, is neural tube defects and there are neural, this one will take you to, um, to another uh, spina bifida fact sheet. And this is the, uh, the link for that. So you can read through all of that. It gives you more um, just extra information if you would like it. And then to also understand that it's not just um, the myelomeningocele, there are also neural tube defects such as anencephaly, which is where uh, the brain, most of the brain is gone. Um, if, like anencephaly, no brain. Um, and then in encephalocele, anything with a seal on it is, some, is a sac, is a tumor type of thing, right? So anything that's protruding. Um, and then um, the craniocervical spine uh, is actually sort of fused together. And so the baby's kind of, oops, like that. It's not compatible with life. Um, and then, so these are the open ones. And then you can also have clothes where it's covered, um, like meningocele. Um, we don't really, just so you know, it's not just, just one thing. There are several things and there's open and closed. Um, and then the testing that you can do, there's also amniotic fluid acetylcholine esterase. So if you have low levels of that, that can indicate a fetal anomaly as well. I think the rest, the neurogenic bladder and bowel, that's all gonna come together. And then that cervical cord injury. So there we go, giving everybody a seizure here, sorry. Um, so for, um, I want to make sure. So sensory limitations associated with neural tube defects at different levels. So basically we're focusing on spina bifida. So that's going to be paraplegia. They're going to have use of, of arms, but the anything uh, bowel bladder below is, is motor sensory is not, um, is going to be impaired. So does that make sense? 
hopefully that helps with the question that you had on ATI a little bit. We talked about the diagnostic procedures, right? Ultrasound, the alpha feta protein, the acetylcholinesterase, um, and we're going to do psychosocial uh, as a as a group thing. And then um, stabilizing and professional is the same thing. Long term care health measure, right? Okay. And so if there were for talking about health promotion to reduce the risk of a neural tube defect, what is some teaching? What is one piece of teaching that you would for sure give to the mom? Increase your folic acid. Ding, ding, ding. Yes. Um, all righty. So are, are we good? Any qu more questions on neural tube defects? You have some resources, because then I was going to move on to, um, to spinal cord injury so that we can spend some time with the, um, with the case study. I know Kelly's good to go. <laughs> yeah, OK. All righty. Thank you, Brittany. All I can see right now is Kelly, Brittany, and Whitney. So um, all righty. So then. Um, we can do the, I'll just go ahead and do the spinal cord one, run through, was that too fast? That was fast enough? At least it was some good information. All right, so when you look at spinal cord injury, so I guess people think of probably Christopher Reeves um, as probably one of the, the people, famous people that we know that's had spinal cord injury, um, but we look in terms of um, how they were injured, the degree of the injury. So in other words, was there a, did the spinal cord get severed? Is it just swollen? Is, it, is, is the lesion halfway through the spinal cord? Um, we look at the skeletal level of the injury. So where in the, the actual skeleton, the vertebrae is the injury. And then we also look at the neurological um, level of the injury. So when you talk about different types, the mechanisms, how people get injured, um, probably can't see this very well, sorry, but there's a flexion, you know, when you get stretched, there's hyperextending, there's a compression. This is the one that I see, have seen a lot in kids is diving accidents. People have, have um, been swimming and gone diving and not realized how shallow the water was or the pool and hit their head and it, it compresses um, and you fracture and then the spinal cord gets, gets cut. Um, and then you can also have flexion rotation injuries, for example. Um, and then what is the degree, the completeness? Is it a total loss or is it an incomplete mixed loss depending? Because remember your signals cross uh, in the spinal cord and going up to the, to the brain. So if it is a complete, uh, we're not gonna worry about the different syndromes. We just wanna know, is it a complete? So the, the injury is like through the entire spinal cord, then the sensory loss um, will be, the motor losses, it's at the, I'm sorry, total loss sensory motor at that level. And then incomplete depends on the specific spinal tracts affected. So if, you're, if you only go halfway in, then it's only gonna be certain, certain parts. We, for sake of argument, are gonna focus on complete. The degree is complete. There's total loss of sensory and motor function and how that affects mobility and nutrition and elimination. And so then you look at the level of the injury. So if you look at the skeletal level, um, the injury is at the level where there's most damage to the bones, the, vert the vertebrae and the ligaments. And then when you look at the neurologic level, the sensory piece of it, um, the sensory and motor piece of it, the lowest segment of spinal cord with the normal sensory and motor function on both sides of the body. So that's what you're saying is that if it's a, um, if it's a say for example, a T1, that's the lowest segment that has normal, everything below T1 is not, does not have sensory or motor function. Does that make sense? So that when they say it's a T1, that's the lowest level that's normal. And then everything below that um, has loss of sensory and motor function, function. You guys following along so far? Just trying to do a basic, basic thing. So this just gives you an example again. Um, we used to call it quadriplegia and you'll still hear, thank you, we'll still hear uh, quadriplegia. Um, but they've gone to the, um, the term tetraplegia because it's really te tetra, I guess it's, they just thought tetra was better. Um, and so C8 and above, it just shows you sort of where the, the cutoffs are. And that's why when you have spina bifida, you're down in this area here, down in the sacral, um, lumbar sacral region. And so that's why you have um, the lower limb 
and bladder bowel problems. That's where that comes in. Um, one of your objectives is to be familiar with the Asia impairment scale. This is an example of the um, Asia impairment scale talking about, again, is it a complete injury, incomplete? It sort of defines it for you um, and also can help to determine um, rehabilitation, rehab potential. I may ask you what it is, but I'm not gonna ask you about classifications on that. You just need to know it exists. So different um, injuries, causes, right? Fall, uh, diving accidents, the um, ATVs. I saw at one point when I was working on the spinal cord um, injury floor, I worked at Shriners in Sacramento. Um, I was the um, nurse manager for the um, adolescent unit, which was mostly um, spinal cord injuries. And so we saw trampolines, ATVs. Um, I had a few gunshots, knife wounds, um, attempted suicide, tumors, like uh, Friday night lights. They call it Friday night lights. The football players that come in, high school football players that would come in on Friday nights um, because they got you know hit in the head and had concussions and they would be in C collars um, because we didn't know. They couldn't feel anything, they couldn't move. And so we didn't know what was going on. And so you just immobilize them and um, promote their oxygenation and, and hope and then, and then wait. So it's a waiting game. Um, and so um, some of the things that you're really worried about with spinal cord injury would be, uh, we, we think about the loss of motor sensation function, but that can also affect how you breathe, the respiratory drive. Um, and oftentimes you're gonna see hypotension, bradycardia, um, and hypothermia um, and, and neck pain, obviously. <laughs> um, and then what will happen if we take our Friday night lights example for our football player, um, they're going to be in what's called spinal shock, spinal cord shock. And so the deficit could resolve as long as the shock resolves. Usually three days to a couple weeks is what you're being get through. The, the first 24 hours is, is key. And as you, as you keep going to the 48 and 72, um, generally it's, it's edema that's the problem. And so once you can get all the edema and the, and the body to go, oh, okay, I'm not in trouble anymore, then it, it, it will calm down and, and the motor and sensory deficits will, will recover. Um, so this is where taking a complete history is very important. And also that neuro exam, remember we did neuro exam in first semester, right? And that's why all those things, those, the cranial nerve tests, all those things are so important. Uh, so that you know how to do a complete neuro exam. They're gonna do CT scans, they could do x-rays, MRIs, um, and maybe angiograms if they need to. And then these, are, it's just kind of repeating the areas so you kind of see, um, so C4, cervical four, there's, remember there's seven cervicals, so if it's a C4, complete paralysis below the neck. So that's the part that's shaded here. So this is one of the questions that you're going to get on that case study. It's going to ask you based on this um, particular patient, where would you expect um, the paralysis to occur? And so then if it's C6, it shows you there, T6, L1. And so anywhere in between there is going to be variations of the shaded in areas. Um, so see on the C6, if you have like a C6, seven, somewhere in there, the person can still shrug their shoulders. And so you wanna develop what you can develop. And so these people, these I've seen um, patients like with their sh shoulder shrugs, they can actually get their arm to move all the way over just from, from uh, doing a, sh a shoulder shrug. Um, we talked about that already. You're gonna see in the spinal shock as well, it's gonna be flaccid paralysis. So it's everything's flaccid, loose, right? And then, um, flaccid bladder and bowel, so there's no tone, right? It's flaccid. And then again, reviewing the shock, it's temporary. Um, it can last days to usually weeks, could be three months, 50% um, approximately of patients get that. Um, and you get the loss of sensation and the flaccid, the floppy paralysis below the level of the, of the injury. Um, and then, we talked about that. And then collaborative care. So where do we go, right? Airway and breathing, right? ABCs. And then with the neurogenic shock that comes, which is, we have that in a couple other slides, 
you have to keep the blood pressure up. So there's meds that you're giving to, um, to do that. Um, and here's where the crossover to tracheostomy uh, comes in and the ventilator support, because if it's a, a C4, C3, um, high, um, they can't breathe on their own. So they're going to be ventilator dependent. So if you think of Christopher Reeves, and I forget off the top of my head, but I wanna say he was a C2 or C3, and that's why he had, um, he was ventilator dependent, right? I think he could, he could move his, his head. Um, if there's any things that you can do for the spine, they can do, um, they can decompress the vertebrae, um, they can do some different tractions, make sure there's no other head injuries or internal injuries because if you have a complete injury and you have no sensation or motion, I can't tell you that my stomach hurts. I can't tell you that my leg hurts. And so there could be some internal bleeding, there could be some broken limbs, there could be all kinds of things that are, are masked because the patient can't tell you um, how they're feeling or what they're experiencing. And different types of medications, um, stool softeners are good. And then here's some different examples of skeletal traction. One of your um, objectives is to know about the halo traction. Um, these are what are called Gardner Wells tongs. Yes, that's into the skull. Um, and then it has uh, weights here, it's traction. So it's pulling, I think you can see it here to where it's gonna be pulling so that they can align um, the spine again. And then there's um, a halo traction brace. So yeah, and yes, those pins are going into the skull and it keeps the, um, the spine in alignment. So the person can't turn their neck, they've gotta go like, like that, and it keeps it in alignment. Um, and then you do pin care, right? Because around these pins, um, it's going into the skull, right? And so um, you wanna do pin care. We used to do half strength hydrogen peroxide, but now it's, um, you use sterile saline and an antibiotic ointment is generally what happens. We usually do once a shift, um, can be as needed. And then, um, Sometimes they'll use weights. I've not seen a halo with weights, but you can. I like the vest because the vest, it's called a TLSO, a, thumbar, um, a thoracic lumbar sacral orthotic, TLSO. And it, it really carries the weight of the halo, which is nice. And still you're able to walk around and, and have some, um, or not walk, but because uh, you wouldn't have that if you had the halo, my bad. It helps you to, to keep your posture straight. So you're not gonna slump. In other words, is what I'm saying. It gives you some, to be able to, to sit up straight. Um, so there can be loss of respiratory function, depends on where the level is. Um, so if it's C4 and above, C3, C4, breathe no more. So that's a, a thing to remember about those levels. Um, and this kind of breaks it down. To, this goes back to that picture where the, the body was shaded in. So I would know in general, um, what areas are affected. Um, respiratory interventions, right? So if we can't, if there's respiratory problems, you're going to do what? You're going to assess, right? Do your assessments, look at the breathing patterns. You may have to, um, you know, like chest PT or um, having them take deep breaths, like uh, to help keep the um, tidal volume uh, up. So chest PT, oxygenation, assist with coughing right? Because it's going to be difficult for them to cough, but if there's secretions, you want to get the secretions out. So helping them to cough, because um, what happens if the secretions end up staying in, in the lungs? What's the patient at risk for? Pneumonia. Pneumonia, because they're not moving either, right? So pneumonia. So if you can help them with coughing, that will help to, to, clear, the, to clear the phlegm, clear all that out because we don't want them getting an infection on top of what they already, what they already have. So we have to try and do um, as much of that as possible. Incentive spirometry, it comes back all the time, right? Incentive spirometry. Um, and so we also talked about vagal responses yesterday, right? That was something that Mr. Espinas talked about. Um, and uh, you can get bradycardia, the, the vasodilation, hypotension, um, hypovolemia, pooling of blood, that's neurogenic shock. Again, it's, that's on the other page I'll show you. Um, 
So again, you need the vasopressors to help support because you have decreased cardiac output. Blood pressure is going to drop. We need to keep the blood pressure up. Why would um, DVT be a problem or pulmonary embolism? Why are they at risk for that? Because they're not moving and they can't. They're, yep, because they're not moving. And so this is where you might need to do some girth measurements, um, Doppler exams, where you're going to have to look and see is, it, is there redness or swelling or warmth? And then food fluid elimination, right? The gut. The gut's not really going to work. The, gut, the body's like, what do I need my stomach for? I'm trying to fix all this other, regulate all this other stuff, right? So you can see some stress ulcers. You could see some um, intra-abdominal bleeding, the paralytic ileus, which is where the gut's really not moving and everything kind of gets stuck there. So a lot of times um, they might have a nasogastric tube. I don't know if Reglan's the first line anymore, but they'll have something to help um, regulate the acidity and, and to help with, um, to GERD and regurgitation. Um, and then just being careful not to put the patient into alkalosis or acidosis to keep them where they need to be. High protein, high protein. We've got to build up that, um, that muscle mass. And then loss of body weight. Um, and the nutritional needs, again, are much greater than for an immobilized person because everything else is, is trying to overcompensate. So um, they might be on... Um, they're probably not going to be eating necessarily, but they'll be on high calorie supplements. Um, and then we're also looking for, let's see, let's keep going to urinary. So there's going to be, remember they're the acute phase where they're the Friday night lights are going to have urinary retention. Um, the bladder, the bladder is not going to have um, any tone. And so it's just going to fill and fill and fill and become over distended because um, the signals are not getting sent like, hello, you need to pee, your bladder's full because it's, there's no tone, there's no message going. And so um, they'll put a Foley in so that the bladder stays, um, stays emptied. And then after that initial recovery, after that first um, you know, days up to the three months, you get into the post-acute phase. And so then everything kind of goes the total opposite way. Everything becomes um, hyper irritable or hypertonic or you're, where the legs are flaccid. Now they're gonna be really, really rigid. Um, and so oftentimes then there's just reflex emptying. They're just peeing and peeing and peeing because um, there's no, again, no regulation. And so then we're going to talk about on the other page how to some things that we can do to help with that. And then you can also get neurogenic um, bowel generally at T12 or below. Um, and there, the bowel's um, an initially areflexic, right? We lose our tone. There's no sphincter tone. And so, so they can just um, have stools whenever. Um, and then when the reflexes start to return a little bit, the tone is enhanced almost too much could potentially be. Um, and then it's just, there's no, there's no control. Um, and so what you want to do is do a regular bowel program again, which I'll, I have some good videos about that. Um, and what's the gastrocolic reflex? What does that mean? What's the easy way to say the gastrocolic reflex? Gastro? Gas and gas. <laughs> <laughs> Stomach, right? When do, we, when do we have a bowel movement? After we eat, right? So you wanna try and coordinate the um, bowel program sometime after they've had a meal. Generally when I've seen it is in the evening before bedtime, but it could be at any point during the day. But if you've put food in and it's digested a little bit, so you wait an hour, and then there's then the, the stool will have formed and you'll be able to eliminate it. I know it's such a big word, and all it really means is after they eat, after they eat. Um, tissue integrity, skin safety, skin breakdown. Oh my gosh, pressure injuries that I have seen on some of these spinal cord um, patients. We used to have patients that would come up from Mexico that literally were living um, in a hut on a dirt floor, and so that pressure injuries. Um, on their sacrum and buttocks were just, it was, um, it was, I don't, I don't know, because they can't feel, they, they don't know that it's there unless they have somebody checking and helping them. Um, and so you can get major sepsis and infection. So a lot of times these patients would come in for their, we call them tune-ups in the summer, and they'd spend all summer with us because they were on a wound vac uh, and antibiotics to clear up the infection. 
Um, and there's really no, uh, that's why we have the little froggy there. There's really no thermoregulation. Um, the it depends on the level of the injury, but the, again, that the signals aren't talking to each other. And so there's a decreased ability to sweat or shiver. And that's how we regulate, right? Is, is by shivering to stay warm or we sweat um, to, to cool down. And that ability is not, is not there depending on the level of injury. Okay, another key point things, um, and I, I don't know if Abram's here. He's, he's my other uh, resident expert on SCI, but autonomic dysreflexia, or you might hear it termed hyperreflexia. Have, has anybody heard of that term before? Or witnessed somebody going through that? Okay, so autonomic dysreflexia um, happens, occurs in a patient that has a spinal cord injury higher than T6. So T5 and up, so it's higher than T6. So any of your cervical, your C2, C7, all, any of those in the T5, one through fives. Um, and what happens is there's a, a major, it's a um, sympathetic nervous system response, which is what, what's sympathetic nervous system? This is Swiss. Is that is when they have like a muscle spasm all the time? Um, not not really. They can have a spasm. That's a, that's a little bit different. Um, but uh, they could have a spasm. It could be a spasm that causes it. Um, and so what happens is they get um, because they're the signals aren't talking right. That there's a there's a a cut between the top and the bottom half. Right, and so the messages don't don't connect. Right, if I have to go to the bathroom, it sends a signal to my brain that says go to the bathroom um, in so many different ways. Um, but now I don't have that. I have to go to the bathroom. My bottom half knows I have to go to the bathroom because I got my bladder um, the the sensory back, but it's not able to tell my my brain that hey go to the bathroom. And so what happens is that you get severe peripheral hypertension. And so if you think about somebody that's like in a hypertensive crisis or how it feels to be really hypertensive, this is, is what happens. So I use the bladder example because that's oftentimes what the problem is. So the nerve response is going into overdrive because the bladder is, is full. And so what you're going to see, and if you have patients that have, that have had the spinal cord injury for a while, they know it's coming. It's kind of almost like an aura. They know it's coming. Um, and you get a sudden, a quick, significant rise in the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. You can get a, you get a drop in the heart rate. They'll start to flush, like their face, neck, and shoulders will, will start to flush. They might get goosebumps above the, uh, on the top half. Um, a lot of times headache is the, is the big one that we hear. Um, nasal congestion is another one. Um, and so these are these are all signs and symptoms that the person is experiencing autonomic dysreflexia, right? The increase in blood pressure, the flushing, the goosebumps, the he headache a lot of times. Um, and so the first thing that you do um, to decrease the blood pressure as soon as possible is, is make sure that the client is sitting up. So that's the first thing you're going to do. They could already be sitting up, but if they're not already sitting up, sit them up. And then you've got to check for a cause. Right, we've got to figure out what the problem is. Is it a full bladder? I've seen it be closed, like they've got a, a crease in the clothes. You know how if you sit on the, the, the crease too long and you get a little indentation in your skin and, it, and you go, oh man, that hurts. And you just kind of shift a little bit. Well, they, they can't do that because they can't feel it. So they don't know. Um, so it can be a little thing, little thing like that, or it could be the, it could be a full bladder or constipation or other irritations. And so, um, excuse me. This is the actual nervous system way of, of talking about it. The, the messages don't, don't get through. So they're actually kind of fighting each other. I have to pee. No, you don't. I have to pee. No, you don't. And <laughs> blood pressure just keeps going up. Um, and so these again are, question? I had a quick question. So um, that would be different from the vasal vagal, right? Can't they, Correct. Also, can't they also get a vasal vagal where their blood pressure drops? In the yes. And so that would be an opposite thing of what, of what's happening here. Yes. It could be, for example, while they're doing their bowel program and you're doing the rectal stimulation or they're having the bowel movement, that could cause a vasovagal response. And so you'd see the drop in blood pressure. This would be more where it's constipated and probably open. they need to have the bowel program done. It's, it's mostly, I, I mean, I would say it's mostly the full bladder, 
Um, but again, it could be, it could be other things. And I, literally it's like 200 over hundred. I mean, it just like shoots up. They'll hit the call light that at least the patients I know, um, you know, will start yelling for help or something, or they'll be like, cath me, cath me now. You need to, cath, you know, straight cath me now. Um, because they might've had more fluids than they normally have, right? And so the, the bladder's now um, distended. And so you actually will see different things um, above and below. The flushed face, again, the headache is when I see the nasal congestion. Uh, you'll actually start to see sweating. Um, let's see, da, da, da. and so we said sit them up if you can. If so this is a thing where you know you're in trouble. You can't do all this yourself. You're going to have to call for help. So what you're going to probably do is as you're sitting the patient up, you're either help, I need help, or you're hitting the call light to get other people in to help you because you're going to sit the patient up. Somebody else will probably come in to assess the blood pressure, although you need to know the blood pressure, right? But we need to find out the blood pressure, but somebody's got to figure out what the problem is. Sometimes the patient can tell you most of the time, you know, if it's a newer injury, they can't. So if they have a Foley, you need to check for kinking, making sure that the tubing isn't, isn't kinked, right? So that the urine's retained in the bladder. You wanna make sure that's, that the Foley is, um, you know, is patent. Um, you wanna insert a new catheter. You could do a straight cath and then um, do the Foley, you know, insert the Foley later. You wanna check the rectum for if there's an impaction, loosen any, any constrictive clothing. Um, oftentimes they'll have antihypertensives um, PRNs ordered for this. And so you would administer the hypertensive. Um, if it's a newer injury and they don't really know what's happening, if they're on a monitor, you're going to see the blood pressure start to go up and up and up. And you might see the flushing in their face, those types of things. Um, and so, so does that make, this is like a critical emergency, right? They can stroke out if the blood pressure gets, gets too high. Right, that's why this is an emergency. So sit them up, get the blood pressure checked, figure out what's going on, address the problem. And sometimes you're doing multiple things because you don't know, you can't, you don't know what it is. So you just keep going, you get somebody to go run and get the medication to give the medication. Um, so basic uh, nursing care. So when they're coming at like, again, your Friday night lights, EMTs, you probably, if, I, if Emily's still here, other EMTs, um, right? It's a C, C collar, you know, immobilized log rolling, right? Where you log roll them all, all together um, to keep the spine in alignment. Um, there could also be other things that you can't, that you can't see because of the, um, the swelling edema um, or if they're on traction, you're always right respiratory always checking respiratory they can't regulate their body temp so be aware of that intake and output and then let's see let's do let's talk about well, let's see we'll do support and counseling when we talk about when we're back on the other page because that's going to kind of cover everything um in ARU do you guys have any spinal cord injuries if there's anybody from ARU here or what kind of uh rehab are you doing in ARU Nobody's been in ARU. I was um, following PT in ARU, and we mm -hmm. had a spinal cord injury. And I Ooh. followed him. Um, both PT and OT were help carrying him to ARU, mm -hmm. and they had um, like orange cones, and they were taking turns. You know, the therapist would hold one of the cones, and he would try to grab a cone and put it on top of the other cone. So we did that. Oh, one. okay. And that kind of seems sort of I don't know juvenile or silly. But I mean, the dexterity that it takes, right, to pick up is, is yes. that yes. With the, like, right? The dexterity to, to pick it up or to, do, I mean, that takes strength and dexterity. And so even sometimes it's just holding a ball. I had one, um, one teenager who um, they did a, a tendon release on his um, hand and he was actually able to, with this brace that they had for him, to pick up a soda pop can and drink his own soda pop can right he could pick it and then it was like amazing it's these little things that we all take for granted it's it's amazing um are there have you seen other spinal cord injuries anybody else thank you i think that was jj right thank you for sharing 
Um, no, all right, I'll keep going. Is this making sense? Is it is it kind of following along? Is it making some sense? It's kind of difficult to, to grasp the concept sometimes. Um, hopefully some of the videos I have posted will help. You can, can do your own, um, own searches. Um, so as, re as recovery begins below the level, the shock starts to resolve. And so you go from being flaccid, which is very loose to spastic, which that might be what you're thinking of Armel is when the spasticity comes back and that's when they start to have, it's like contractures or um, the, you know, the, the autonomic nervous system is now waking up. We've been in sympathetic all the time. Now autonomic is coming in. Um, and so you get that increasing um, spasticity. You can also get some voluntary movement, but a lot of times it's, it's like a spasm, you know, and, and the limb will just move. Um, and so you get uh, spasms, hyperreaction, hyperactive responses, um, uh, spasms, yeah. And then so you can use, um, I don't think we use Xanaflex that much anymore. I know baclofen is a big one. The botulinum toxin injections um, can help to, to treat the spasticity um, with the, uh, sometimes the children that have cerebral palsy that have the contractures will uh, in, put in baclofen pumps that continue to, to emit, to, to release baclofen and that helps to, to relax the spasticity. Um, and so that's a, that's a good thing. Um, I'm trying to think what else, what else? Okay. Questions on, on that for right now. Um, do you guys want to take a five minute break or do you want me to just keep going? Or I can just keep going and if you need to go take a bio break and stuff, just go and, and come back. Why don't we just do that? Okay. I am not offended. Does that work? Okay. Thanks, Marco. Um, all right. So let's go back to our objectives. So we talked about the Asia impairment scale already. Um, we're going to go a little more into spinal cord shock and neurogenic shock. Um, we talked about that, we talked about that, and then we're going to start talking about like rehab and, and stabilizing the spinal column um, and talking about the team, uh, the team approach. We talked about autonomic dysreflexia, and so now we're going to really focus on the neurogenic bladder and bowel as well. So you have here some, um, some resources to help you. I don't know if you can see that very well, but this is a chart. Um, that actually goes through and, and uh, sort of lays it out for you. What's tetraplegia, what's paraplegia, what, what um, um, the level of injury is, but it also shows you the rehab potential. So what is, we want the, the client to be as, as independent as possible, right? We, that's always our, our goal, right? And so, you know, doing, doing the teaching and having them in, in ARU or different places like that is, um, is the goal. So this sort of gives you a, an idea of that. This particular link will take you to uh, this article from the Shepherd Center, uh, understanding different levels of injury, what you should know about spinal cord injury and recovery. I'm not plugging any specific thing. I just really like the pictures and the way they just, they described it. So um, it will actually take you through this the, the C-spine um, and the nerves and, and where all the levels is, what you can and can't uh, do. Here's a C7. So that might come in handy for your case study. And then it just takes you right on down through the spine, which I, which I really, um, I liked that. So you have that as a, um, a resource. And then this would be the Asia impairment scale. The part that we looked at was the, um, this part in the middle, the A, B, C, D, E. And we actually have another um, little example here um, that tells, that talks about it. And the first page is actually, um, when you're looking at light touch, is there, can they feel it? Can they feel it? Is it a pinprick? What, um, what can they feel, uh, motor and sensory? So that would be an assessment that you would be, be doing. So that's the Asia impairment scale. And then you have, um, our friend, uh, yeah, it's the Kathy Parks. I can't, I could, yeah. Um, so she's got spinal cord injury and then, um, 
I'm going to skip through that one for a second. We have our, our lovely purple lady that's going to tell you about neurogenic shock review, neurogenic shock versus spinal shock. So spinal shock is, is basically the initial shock that the body, the body goes into. Um, and then the neurogenic shock has to do with, um, with more the sympathetic response and, and what's happening um, in terms of having a neurogenic bladder, the, the signal's not going to each other. We talked about the neural tube defects. You have another um, link here. That will take you again to the spina bifida fact sheet if you have questions about that. Um, again, your books are great resources. I just, if I find a resource that I think is, is to the point maybe and, and tells a good story, then that's why I put it under the lesson. Um, here's another, she, this is a really good one. She has a really good talk about um, autonomic dysreflexia and, and what it means. And then um, we have some talking about the neurogenic bladder and bowel. So, you know, nobody really likes to talk about pee and poop anyway, putting Foley's in, doing bowel care. I mean, that's all kind of you, you know, but it's things that we, that we have to do. And so, um, so this will tell you that again, in, when it's, when the body's still in shock, the urine's retained because there's no control of the, the bladder. That's the neurogenic bladder. And because um, there's no sensation, you don't know you have to go. And so you get over distension. And actually, what happens if it's in the if the urine's in the bladder? What, what, what's going to happen to the urine if it if it's not being re, being released? Where else can it go? Go back into the kidneys. Yes. Yay! Right. And then you end up with a whole bunch of other problems. And so that's why we want to insert the foley as soon as possible to make sure that the bladder can be um, emptied. And you're going to use your sterile technique. A large fluid intake, right? Because they don't have to worry about it. Flush, flush, flush. Keep the fluids in. Um, IV fluids, mostly. Um, check the catheter. We talked a little bit, I think we've talked about the catheter acquired urinary tract infections. Um, and so just making sure that you're doing, that the bladder is draining and that you're doing the catheter care, cleaning the area, usually I think once a shift um, is really important. And so then once the patient is stabilized, oftentimes you'll move into what's called an intermittent catheterization program. So we talked about with the spina bifida patients, they'll have a super pubic catheter. Um, oftentimes the, um, th there's different types. So, um, and you do that generally probably every four hours. Um, so four to six times daily, um, you wanna keep the residuals under 500. So when you empty the bladder, that tells you how much was in the bladder. And so if it's over 500, you might wanna, have them cath catheterize or catheterize them more frequently. Um, and obviously, if there's any signs or symptoms of infection, man, you need to be on it. So this video I chose because um, she's really cute and uh, she's young and she's really open about um, self-catheterizing herself. And she's got this neat little portable little catheter thing that she uses. So I thought that was just really kind of putting it in perspective. Um, for you to see somebody that really, um, you know, is putting it all out there and, and living with um, their condition. And I thought that was really cool. And then, and also it's a really kind of cool catheter tool. It's not just like a regular catheter. It's like, it's, it's, you'll love it. It's cute. Um, and then if, if catheterizing can be cute, this is, this is it. Um, and then bladder management tools for women, um, just some different things, um, leg bags, uh, female urinals, um, there's like adaptable um, th things that you can use to spread the labia open, um, this kind of clothing that would have an opening in the, um, in the crotch. And then, so, so, so we get that, right? Catheterizing, we're gonna do that probably every four hours. Um, intermittent catheterizing, we, and we've, we taught you Foley, right? And so, you know, I've seen some of you insert Foley's, intermittent catheterization, basically the same premise, no balloon, you find your, you clean, you find your spot, you're in, it empties, you remove it because there's no balloon. That's pretty straightforward, I think. This particular video talks about bowel management after spinal cord injury. Um, and so most people, de depending, there was one video I saw where the woman had um, an ostomy and so she would drain her ostomy. Um, but that was a long video and kind of complicated. So I liked this one much better. Um, what do you think it means, or if anybody's had a patient with a bowel program, what, what needs to occur in a, in a bowel management program? I 
I would say definitely patient teaching in regards to like hydration and um, keeping like a regular schedule um, for mm-hmm. the moments and um, somebody else said compliance. That's true. Mm-hmm. What um, do you know um, the procedure? Do you know what's entailed in a bowel program? Not exactly. That's okay. That's what I'm asking because some people know and, and some people don't. So, so what are medication wise, right? What can we use? What medications would they probably, or medication medications would they probably um, be taking to help with a bowel program? Laxatives, stool softeners. Stool soft- mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Stool softeners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stool softeners, probably Colace, maybe Miralax. Miralax is really good. Um, you know, something to, to help keep the stool soft. And then, um, like we were talking about with the gastrocolic reflex, after you eat, you, um, you got to go. So the body doesn't necessarily recognize that. So we want to try and relate it to that. However, what I've seen um, in, in the, um, the patients that are more on the rehab side is they'll do it, like I said, at hour of, at hour of sleep. And so what that entails is inserting a suppository into the rectum. Yeah, compliance, Kelly. <laughs> yes, we, we don't want them to get constipated because that's not a good thing. Is um, There is insertion of a, a rectal suppository to help um, bring the feces down. And then oftentimes um, a lubricated finger will be inserted into the rectum to do what's called digital stimulation. And so you kind of um, are stimulating around the sphincter and inside the rectum to get the, the feces again to, to move down and out. Um, hopefully there's not an impaction. Um, sometimes you can feel stool in there, but what you're doing is, is kind of loosening it up and getting the, the, the bowel to go, oh, okay, I guess I need to kind of the sphincter, I need to move stuff down. And so you do that. And sometimes the bowel movement will come at that point in time. Sometimes it'll take 10, 15, 20 minutes to happen. And then you go back and you're going to um, dispose of the waste and clean the patient up and and that type of thing. Um, And and every patient will sort of have their own routine of how they like to do that. Um, This video, I believe shows you there's different mechanisms for the patient themselves to insert the suppository. Um, and also bringing other people into the, um, into, uh, you know, to help with that. So it's that part, I think is probably the bowel bladder management. I think that's the, probably the scariest part and the most embarrassing part, right? Cause you're, you're pretty much exposed. Think about when we're doing our, our, um, pure gastric you know, the Purewick external catheter is such a new thing that I don't even know. There's a perfect Pico question. Um, I don't even, I don't even know. The issue, I believe, is that um, the the Purewick catheter, it's external and it's catching anything that's dribbling out. Basically, is what I would understand. The um, spinal cord injury patient is that I'm talking about is not going to be dribbling. It's going to be stuck inside. And so that's why we're straight cathing. And the straight catheter is better over the Foley catheter because it's, we used to call them in and out. It's an in and out catheter. Um, and again, if it's a super pubic, then that's, that's e- not easier. It's easier. It's more accessible. Um, but that's a good question. If I see one more medication or medical supply advertised on TV, I think I'm going to scream. Um, okay, questions on bowel or bladder care. Yeah, mm-hmm. Oh, could be sometimes enemas, if that's what needs to happen. Um, fleets enemas is usually what we what we might do because those are the, the smaller ones. Um, you kind of have to figure out what works for the patient. And then over time that could change, right? So you, you have to be open to two options there. Yeah. Bowel, and bowel programs could be for many different reasons, but it's like, you know, it's got to be the same time every day. Cause the body then gets into the habit. The, the body expects, Oh, okay. It's like, you know, seven, eight o'clock doesn't know what time it is, but it knows what time it is. Right. I need to, to poop. They better come do the did stim. So, right. And then it's and the bowels ready. Um, okay. Collaborative care. Um, so this is, this is an example of cervical cord injury. Um, but again, it, it could be 
you know, it's, it's teamwork, it's collaborative therapy, which I think is great. So um, the diagnostics we talked about already, and then acute care, again, the C collar, immobilizing the vertebral column, doing the log rolling, checking the, the, um, the vital signs, putting the NG tube in probably to suction because we don't know there could be an abdominal injury that, that the patient can't tell us about. Um, maybe intubation, oxygen, uh, the Foley, IV fluids, um, and then the stress ulcers, DVT prophylaxis, and the bowel and bladder training, right? That's a huge team effort. Most of that falls on the nurse to do, right? We're doing that, um, that education. Hopefully they get to go to a rehab facility or someplace that specializes in spinal cord injury, um, which is also helpful. And then rehab and home care, right? So physical therapy for the range of motion, mobility, muscle strengthening, OT, right, which is your ADLs. So that's where the functional ability comes in and being able to, what is it that you're able to, to do for um, ADLs, the bowel and bladder training, recognizing the autonomic dysreflexia, so you're able to prevent it, to, to prevent it, recognize it, and also to treat it. And then um, the pressure ulcers, tissue integrity, um, recreational therapy. We don't really talk about recreational therapy. I don't know as hospitals have that department anymore. I know um, if it's a rehab hospital or oftentimes um, pediatric hospitals will have recreational therapy departments. Um, and so what do you think that is? It's not a trick question. Recreational therapy. Okay, so recreational therapy literally is recreational therapy. Outside activities, arts and crafts, sure, any of that kind of thing, teaching them how to have fun basically. Now that I can't move my legs, what are some activities that I can do, that I can do? Right. If I'm if I am arts and crafts, say I used to be a great artist, but I can't really use my hands as well right now. What are some things that I can do with OT that's going to help my mobility? And maybe I can um, maybe I can learn how to draw, you know, with with a fist or with your mouth or your feet or you know whatever whatever it is. Um, music therapy is another one that can do that. Sometimes uh, they'll take them on. Um, uh, what is it, to the, the therapeutic uh, equestrian equine programs, things like that. Um, but yeah, learning how to do outside art activities like that, right? Who wants to stay in that? That's what I love about Shriners because like the whole second floor is a play area. It was amazing, like had video games and, and things to, to, to uh, play on and it was really cool. And then a lot of it, most of it is the patient and caregiver teaching. It's all about the education. Um, so let's go back up, make sure we've hit most of our, uh, whoops, oh my gosh, so sorry. Hit most of our objectives here. So we went over that, we went over that. So I think we're on to, let's see, long-term, we talked about that. Rehabilitative plans of care. We talked about halos, we did that, the C collars, rehab potential, right? Okay. So um, let's talk about then the, um, how to support the client and family. Um, what, so we talked about health promotion for neural tube defects. What kind of health promotion teaching could you do to reduce the risk of spinal cord injury? To drive safe, like not speed. Um, don't dive into like shallow waters or like mm -hmm. water that you don't know how deep it is. Mm -hmm. I feel like a hypocrite because I have a trampoline, but be careful on the trampoline. <laughs> oh, I know it was, I was, my kids were little, the neighbor had a trampoline. Um, and yeah, I was just like, I was terrified. Um, and it's only because you, you see it, you know, after you take care of your first, yeah, safety equipment, helmets, exactly wear your seatbelt, don't drink and drive, all those things. You just never know. My um, nephew was in a, a car, an auto accident and uh, um, he, it was bad. We thought we were going to lose him. Um, and he's uh, paraplegic now, 
but you know, it's, it's a for life thing. Um, we had, we had, we had, I remember one, one child we had that was on an ATV and it flipped and it flipped into a pond or a puddle or something. And they got, they got trapped in the water. So it was actually a near drowning and spinal cord injury. That was not fun. Um, so what are some ways that you can think to uh, support the client, the client's family in trying to, to cope with the changes? What, what kind of conversations would you have in the emergency room or the ICU, right? Say it's Friday night lights and, um, you know, what, what are those conversations going to entail? Open-ended questions to kind of get them to express their feelings. Mm -hmm. Oh, good job, Kelly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Resources, support groups. Are you, are you, if they're in the ER and, and they've just gotten there, or they're stabilizing the patient, or maybe they just come to ICU, are there any things you're not going to really talk about yet? <laughs> or go into as much detail yet? If it's within that first, pardon? The outcome? Yeah, because we don't know the outcome. Am I, am I gonna maybe talk to them about a bowel program and, um, and you know, catheterization or you know, putting a, a wheelchair ramp in their house at that point? The answer is no, because we don't know yet, not in those first couple days. We, we, don't, we have to wait and see. Um, oh my gosh sat down in a chair too forcefully and the back of his neck hit the back. Oh my goodness. Hyperextension. Ugh. JJ, I'm so sorry. You, you just never know. You, it's just amazing. So we don't want to scare them, right? So I, I, think, I think the resources, encouragement to open up, listen, right? To state their may, yes, without being too specific, right? Especially in those first three days, it really is a wait and see game. Right, I would try to focus on, um, especially because there's going to be monitors and IVs and the Foley and all these things. And so probably, um, you know, explaining why those things are being used right now, right? And that, you know, especially if it's your child, you know, your child can still hear you, you know, we can try and get, you know, assuming it's not COVID or whatever, um, you know, you can stay with your child's, you know, those try, things that that parent can do or the, the support person can do for the patient. Right, because I don't want to feel helpless. Right. So if I can, you know, if you can just say, well, here you can hold their hand, or here, just talk to them, or you know, sit with them. They know that you're here, or you know, something like that, and explain, you know, why the Foley is there, why they're getting the fluids, maybe the testing that would be done, because they're gonna want to know the answer. If it's my kid, I'm gonna want to know, are they, are they um, are they never gonna walk again? Are they gonna walk, you know, those kind of things? And we just don't know. So I think, I think uh but to be honest, it, but you are being honest. We don't know. It just takes time. And I think that's one of the hard things, right? And so then does that make sense? Like in that first, those first couple of days? Thumbs up, sir, appreciated. Yes, yes, says thumbs up. Yes, thank you. Um, and so now the patient um, has kind of, the swelling has kind of go down, has gone down. We realize that maybe it's a C7. So I'm gonna, this is like our little segue into, uh, which I didn't post on the page. Um, oops, let's just go back there. We'll go to our little case study. Cause what I'm gonna do is, is run through the case study with you and then I'm gonna let you go. So you guys can either work on it in groups together or whatever, whatever you wanna do. And that will get us out of here a little bit, a little bit earlier. Cause it is Friday and this was a lot of information. And so, so that's why I keep mentioning C7 because that's the level that your case study patient uh, is on, right? So now they've figured out that um, they do have a C7 injury and they're coming onto the floor. So, so we're not at this point, uh, yeah, placing, yes, yeah, so that's a little bit different. So now they're on the floor, we're waiting to see. So now we're gonna start, to, now we know it's a C7. So now what are we gonna, how are we gonna talk to the patient and to the patient and to their support person? and help them. We're not in rehab yet. 
we're still in the hospital, right? Because we come in, we're probably in the emergency room, we stabilize, we go to the ICU, then maybe we go to the floor, and then even rehab in the hospital, and then we're probably, you know, eventually going to go home and have outpatient rehab. So right now, we've come out of the ICU, we know it's a C7, how do we support the patient and the support person? Any idea, ideas, thoughts? Are you gonna to continue to do some of the same things that you were doing already? Talking to them about in the, in the ICU or in the ER and the ICU? Yes, maybe you can provide a little bit more, more specific information about what they might expect um, just because now you know where the level's at and what most people um, experience with that. Mm -hmm. I like that, how most people experience that, right? Because their experience is going to be their own experience, right? But this, and, and I'll say that oftentimes, this is what I've seen uh, for the most part, but your experience may be, may be different. I think supporting the patient in being able to recognize, because their body's different now, right? And so to try and get in touch with, with what it feels like now, in their body. Now, the, the person is probably going to, at some point, I think it's almost like, like, oh, okay, this, uh, this is a new thing. I got this, I got this. And then all of a sudden, boom, the depression hits. So you have to be looking for that um, as well. And then hopefully when it's time to get ready to, you know, then you move into the rehab. So what kind of conversations are students having in rehab? regardless if it's spinal cord injury or not, right? Because those, those patients are rehabbing for a reason and then probably going home with some outpatient therapy maybe. What, um, what kind of conversations are you having there? Okay, so. Um, you're probably, I'm guessing, that you're having conversations um, having to do with getting ready to go home, right? And so they're going to have an interdisciplinary approach, like a care conference, right? We talk about discharge planning and care conferences, right? And so are they going to need a wheelchair, a wheelchair ramp? Um, how are you going to have to rearrange the house? If there's stairs and the bedroom was upstairs, maybe we now have to bring it down to the living room, and the living room now becomes the bedroom. Um, what kind of foods are we, you know, those things about transitioning to home, what kind of foods can we feed? How do I set this up if they have a G-tube? Where do I put the urinary catheter supplies? You know, what's my schedule? How do I tell my friends about this? And again, those, like you were saying, those resources and other, other things I think are very, yep, with occupational therapy. Sometimes you'll have the therapist that can come in for a while and then, the, and then eventually the patient can go to outpatient therapy, but continuing the therapy to promote the most independence. I think um, also sometimes um, there's so much information if it's like a parent or, you know, maybe asking if there's, um, you know, someone, someone else that can help um, just to, just to like sit in and, and mm -hmm. you know, someone who may catch something that, you know, they don't, because, you know, when you're a parent or, or a spouse or whatever, you know, you may not be catching everything that's coming at you from the nurse or the therapist or whatever. Exactly. I think that's, that's, that's wonderful, Raul, right? Because I know when my kids were born and we had birth defects, I was like, I don't remember anything, right? So my husband was there. He's like, honey, they said this, this, and this. I'm like, oh, okay. And then I could process. So I think, I think that's a really good idea. And that's what gets taken away during COVID. You know, so I just can't even imagine the sequel A, the outcomes, things that we're going to see because the support may not have, have been there. Um, so basically for your case study now, again, if you want to do it in a, in a small group together, that's fine. Just make sure all your names on, are on it and just have one person submit it. Um, so they're newly married, they're college students, uh, so they're 23. Um, he had a boating accident. 
uh, fracture, laceration of the cord at C7, and they put him in the halo traction, right? It shows a fracture. So it's this partial laceration. So it's not a complete one. Um, I can make it complete. That probably would make it easier. Um, and so he's got the flaccid paralysis initially, right? There's his vital signs. There's blood gases, um, which don't really have to do much with anything other than the O2 sat. Um, distended, uh, bladder's distended, bowel sounds, no bowel sounds, sleepy, but easy arousable. So do you think you can come up with, I'm not asking you to write this second, but I'm saying I'm walking you through it so you know what the expectation is, right? You can come up with some priority nursing interventions given this information. Yes, I'm gonna take that as a yes. Um, and then now after seven days in acute care, the neurologic status stabilized, he's transferred to your rehab unit, right? And so given the cervical fracture, um, indicate the motor function you would be expecting to assess and would that change? And then you're gonna look at the dermatome to answer this question. So this is the halo traction, right? And so what areas would have complete sensation, limited sensation, no sensation, um, and how would you assess this? So I think neuro assessment, and might that change? And so then he has reflex neurogenic bladder that fills and empties automatically. You started um, to teach the wife to um, how to facilitate the bladder emptying and intermittent, you teach, you've taught her intermittent catheterization. Um, he's also on a bowel training, retraining program. So stool softeners, right? There we go, to prevent fecal impaction. Um, and then to Rose's point, at times the wife seems overwhelmed, right, with her new husband's problems. So not only does he did he just have an injury, they're new, they're newlyweds still, right? Um, and so nutritional needs. And then it asks you to, to talk about, you know, the neurogenic bladder. What are you going to include in the bowel training program? To whom and how will you teach? So I think we've gone through, right, a lot of these. You feel like hopefully, yes, that we've gone through a lot of these already. You're able to do that. Um, and then he gets it. So now he, after lunch, he gets a throbbing headache. His forehead um, is wet with perspiration and his face is flushed. What's the first thing you should be thinking? Check his catheter. Yeah. Blood pressure. <laughs> sit him up. Blood pressure. Yes. Sit him up. Take his vital signs. Sit him up. There we go. Thanks, Roel. Um, vitals. Oh my gosh. 250 over 160. Wow. Okay. And bradycardic. There we go. Um, right. And he's cool. Pill. Alarm wants you to do something. And so, right. There you go. Pretend. So think of potential causes or stimuli. Probably no right or wrong answers there. And is, are her concerns warranted? Yes. Darn skippy they are. And then, so what priority nursing interventions would you come up with? Okay, and then, so that was the meat, I think, of what we've gone through today. You should be able to do those um, for today. And then now we're 10 days later, he's gonna sit up in the chair. Um, why, do we, why are we concerned about dizziness or hypotension for the patient? Um, they, they're talking through things now. Um, the patient still has angry outbursts, of course. Um, now, this is a good one, age and developmental level. So go back and think about young adult according to Erickson and Piaget, um, are the psychosocial behaviors related expected? Um, and then you're gonna have to research a little bit on your own um, approaching sexuality, like what are options available to clients with a C7 spinal cord injury? Um, and then if you were the client's wife, how could a nurse best help you ov overall, right? If, if you were the wife, what would you want the nurse to do for you, to how to help you? So does that make sense? I, I think you can pretty much get through one through nine, like we like I, I, oh, I made my goal, yay. Um, <laughs> we did a lecture, right? And then you guys can work on um, 10 through 13. Again, small groups. Um, uh, we're going to say that he is a complete, because uh, that's what we talked about today. So I'm gonna, I'll change partial to, just we'll make partial complete, okay? That'll make it way easier because then you don't have to overthink things, right? So he's a complete, C7. And um, and again, Monday by midnight, small groups, right? You good? Does that work for everybody? Yes. Yes, maybe no. Thank you. Anybody? Bueller. Bueller. French. Thank you. Oh, I see some thumbs up. Thank you. I know it's, it's a rough week. I appreciate everybody's, um, <laughs> everybody's patience and, and you guys are doing great. So um, that was basically all I had. Um, stop recording.